It's time now to take a look at what's been making headlines this week and to do that we're joined by Kylie Moore Gilbert, author and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies scholar. Kylie Moore Gilbert, it's great to have you on the program this morning. We're going to start off with an article in the Washington Post looking at the reaction from that decision um, to overturn Roe versus Wade in the United States. Some very strong responses from across the world, particularly from global leaders, some strong condemnation. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. Um, I don't really have anything particularly profound to add to this other than, you know, that that like everybody else, I'm, I'm outraged about it. I think, um, you know, I, I read an article a couple of weeks ago saying, why can't the rest of the world just mute America, please? Um, and, uh, you know, a particular brand of crazy that they seem to be intent on um, infecting the rest of us with. And um, that you know, this abortion ruling is, is really just the latest in a long string of yeah. utterly um, insane and an arguably backward steps by the United States. And, um, you know, for those who claim that they're pro-life in wanting to restrict access to abortion, in particular for med people with medical conditions, pe people who've been raped or are the victims of incest or any of these, um, you know, very grave situations, I think, well, if you really are pro-life, why do you have unrestricted access to semi-automatic weapons? And why is the US the only country in the world which has these horrific school shootings? and mass killings um, because of the proliferation of guns. Mm. If you really were pro-life, perhaps, you know, deal with that issue rather than targeting women and, and their access to health care. So um, that's my two cents on, on that, really. Um, it's outrageous and I really feel for women in the United States. The thing that struck me about this article from the Washington Post, Kylie, was the fact that, you know, a lot of America's allies, the leaders, they don't really comment on what's happening in America. They don't comment on you know, domestic politics and whatnot. But there's some really strong condemnation coming out, like, you know, for example, Scottish leader Nicola Sturgeon saying, this is one of the darkest days for women's rights in my lifetime. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau described it as horrific. And then on the same time, Europe's far right is celebrating this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we live in a globalised world these days and as have we've seen many other times before, what happens in America doesn't stay in America. Mm. And there are concerns just at the moment when a lot of countries in the world, particularly with Catholic backgrounds, are actually easing up on abortion restrictions. America is going backwards and that might actually influence some of these other nations to go backwards themselves. I think Poland recently um, criminalized abortion mm. and that's really disturbing so unfortunately what happens in America doesn't necessarily stay in America and that's why we've seen world leaders and and also protests in the streets in um, other countries throughout the globe as well as a result of this decision yeah yeah. Kylie, we're going to move on to an article in the New York Times and it's looking at the fact that Iran has dismissed the long-standing intelligence chief of the Revolutionary Guard Force. What's the significance of that decision? So this is actually very, very significant um, within Iranian domestic policy, politics and has a huge impact for not only the many thousands of innocent people who've been tortured and thrown in prison in Iran as a result of this man, Hussein Tayyib's paranoid conspiracy fueled view of the world, um, but also for the dozens of foreign citizens who uh, remain in Iranian prisons, just like I was. I mean, this man, Hussein Tayyab, is responsible for my um, unjust arrest and incarceration, but also that of the other three Australians who we know um, were also arrested by the Revolutionary Guards Intelligence Organization, of which he was the head and has been the head from its inception. He is one of the most powerful men in Iran, uh, reporting directly to the Supreme Leader, and basically had, has been acting with complete impunity and complete disregard for Iran's own domestic laws, mm. uh, as well as obviously international um, human rights laws. He's actually been personally sanctioned by the United States. Um, his organisation has been sanctioned as a terror organisation by the United States. I don't understand why Australia doesn't sanction him. Uh, I actually put forward a list of names uh, last year to Maurice Payne's office and his name was on there. Mm. He's a well-known um, torturer, a human rights abuser, 
sponsor of terrorism, and I think Australia should also sanction him. But his removal is indicative, really, of a power struggle within Iran that's happening right now, in particular due to Israel's alleged targeting mm. and behaviour within Iran's borders, you know, killing of nuclear scientists, killing of prominent IRGC officials, allegedly, um, you know, assassination of Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, the, um, one of the IRGC commanders heading up the nuclear program with a remote operated machine gun, which mm. is just, you know, fantastical, really. Um, and the fact that Israel has essentially been operating within Iran's borders, and this guy hasn't been successful in preventing that. Mm. Um, and a number of plots he engineered against uh, foreign targets abroad, largely Israeli, also failed, including um, the plot by the three bombers in Thailand um, who were exchanged for me in my uh, in the prisoner exchange deal, which brought me back to Australia. So um, Hussein Tayyib's fingerprints are on all of this. He's a well-known terrorist and, and torturer. And the fact that he's finally been moved aside, I think, is probably a good sign um, mm. for the many thousands who are languishing in Iran's prisons, although, you know, his replacement's probably just as bad. Yeah. Kylie, we want to very quickly touch on uh, the last article, and this is from The Australian. It's an interesting one because um, it points out while there's a lot of public outcry um, over Assange, Julian Assange's detention, there's not as much outcry over the Australians that are being detained in China. You know, we're talking about Yang Hengjun here and Cheng Lei as well. Why do you think there's that disparity there? I liked this article um, and I greatly respect Justin Bazzi, who I know has a lot of experience in this space in, in bringing detained Australians abroad home. I didn't agree with everything he said on the Assange case, but I think the broader point that there is a kind of a level of hypocrisy here in that there is this almost messianic fervour by Assange's supporters surrounding him as an individual. But uh, the bigger um, issues at stake here are kind of ignored or, or minimised. And among them is the detainment of not just Assange, but many other Australian citizens abroad by states a hell of a lot less free, open um, and respectful of the, the rule of law than the UK and the US are. And among them are these two Australians being held in China, Yang Heng Jun and Cheng Lai, uh, both of whom are, well, I know Cheng Lai is an Australian citizen only. She's not a Chinese citizen. She's one of us entirely. And and um, her case is very clearly arbitrary detention. She's being held as a political hostage, a political pawn, and she's a journalist as well. Like some have argued Assange is, I think it's it's unclear. He probably could be seen as a publisher more than a journalist and certainly a non-traditional one. But Cheng Lai is actually a journalist. She is only an Australian. She doesn't hold Chinese citizenship. And she's been in prison for almost two years for unclear reasons, been denied a fair trial. Um, Yang Heng Jun is a brave pro-democracy writer who's also been thrown in prison in China and his prospects are even more dire than that of Cheng Lai. And we have not really seen much coverage of this issue, particularly in contrast to that of Assange. And we have other Australians, Robert Pether in Iraq, Sean Tornell in Myanmar, who um, are very clearly also arbitrarily detained. And I'd like to see this issue be brought up much more, not just about Julian Assange, but about some of these more clear-cut cases of arbitrary detention and political persecution by states which are less free and fair than, you know, the US is. And we should be really st standing up to support our citizens, um, all of whom are detained abroad, not just, um, you know, calling for government intervention in the case of Julian Assange. Some very, very good points there, Kylie. Thank you so much for being with us here on Weekend Breakfast. Great to have you on. Kylie Moore-Gilbert there. Thanks so much, guys.